In the early morning hours of November 26th of 1995, an MTA worker named Harry Kaufman was working a shift at the Kingston Throop subway station in the bed section of Brooklyn, New York. The clerk who worked inside of the station's token booth was having a perfectly normal evening until his booth was approached by two men with a sickening plot in mind. Within moments, this man's life and that of his family would be forever turned upside down as he lost his life in one of the most sickening and gruesome crimes that this city ever witnessed. It would also change the lives of three men who fell victim to coercion, and a major Hollywood film was blamed for the entire thing. But was this film really what inspired this heinous attack, or was there more to the story? Prosecutors today saying this case was, quote, riddled with factual errors, coerced confessions, and manufactured evidence, and that the conviction no longer stands. New York City has the biggest subway system in the world, with 472 stations across the five boroughs. Many horrific events have taken place underground, and a lot of those stories have never been told. Today, we take a much closer look at the city's dark underworld. This is Evil Intentions Subway Stories. Harry Kaufman began working for New York City subway system sometime in 1973 in the borough of Brooklyn, New York. Back when Harry began working for the subway system, the title of his job was TA Railroad Clerk before becoming widely known as Token Booth Clerks. By the time 1995 arrived, he had 23 years on the job, a veteran in his position. For those who may not know or remember, back then, if you wanted to ride the subway, you couldn't use credit cards, no debit, and there were no metro cards. You had to buy tokens that allowed you entry through the rickety turnstiles so you could catch the train to your destination. Over the years, many different styles of tokens were introduced, and to purchase them, you had to see a clerk. A lot of stations today still have token booths, some selling and refilling metro cards, and others service customer service stations for those who might need a little bit of help navigating the underground. But the subway system was a lot different in the 90s. It's not too great these days either. But back then, muggings, stabbings, and all sorts of other crimes were known to take place, and much more frequently, with little to no surveillance, unlike today. Harry was born in Brooklyn, New York on December 24th of 1944, a native of the borough. He was born to his parents, Mavis and Harry Ralph Kaufman. He grew up with his parents and two siblings, a brother and a sister. As a kid, he attended PS 93, followed by Nathaniel McCone Jr. High, and attended Boys High School after, all in Brooklyn. He came from a church-going family, going to church on Sundays and attending Sunday school at Rose Hill Baptist Church. According to reports, Harry was known as a man who loved his family, having a very close-knit relationship with them. He was described as hardworking, sensitive, and one of the kindest people anyone could ever meet, as stated by loved ones. The type of person who would do something like bring a co-worker lunch and not even ask for the money. He was just generous that way, thinking of others. Before his time as a transit authority clerk, he worked for American Express as a customer service rep, where he would meet his future wife. And by the time the 90s rolled around, the two of them were married and they had a teenage son. Their son attended LaGuardia High School of Performing Arts, and had a lot of love for the saxophone, an instrument he would grow more and more fond of over time, even playing the sax in a band. Harry was also said to be a big fan of the saxophone. Nothing meant more to Harry than his family. When he left his job at American Express, Harry told his wife, I'm going to take this job, and he was firm about it because he wasn't intimidated by the people on the street committing crimes. He was happy in his position. Every day he got ready for work, he would wear his badge with the number 94741, and he wore it proudly. Harry had seen the area he lived in 
go through many changes over the decades, so he was no stranger to what the streets became after dark. Once he took the job, working underground for so long, he'd seen a lot and even experienced some scary moments himself, getting robbed once before at the Atlantic Avenue station that he normally worked at. One of the biggest issues working for the subway system back then was fare evasion, no different from today. Except back then, it was way easier to hop the turnstile. A time when token booths were known to be heard yelling, pay your fare, to the robotic sounding intercoms the booths had, sometimes sparking tense moments between evaders and clerks. Harry was well aware of the headlines over the years, articles that spoke of the many victims underground, some of them doing the same exact job as him. He was familiar with the dangers that came with his job in the bed area, but it was worth it to Harry. He was working as much as he could because his goal was to continue saving money for his son's college tuition. He was very respected for his strong work ethic. Besides his family, many people held him in high regard. Just a few days after the Thanksgiving holiday on November 25th of 1995, Harry would venture off into the New York subway system once more, this time to work an overtime shift at the Kingston Throops Ave station in Brooklyn, New York. An overtime shift that would carry on into the next morning. His shift was going perfectly normal, as it did most evenings, until around 1.45 a.m. on the 26th, the next day, when Harry's booth was approached by two men, and it was clear from the very start that this night might be taking a turn for the worst. The uptown and downtown platforms had people around, despite the hour. In this city, there's always someone trying to get somewhere, no matter what time it is. Some saw two men approaching Harry's booth. For him, this wasn't weird, because thousands of people a day approached these booths to pay their fare. But these men had nothing to say, and within a few moments, this situation felt very different. According to reports, one of the men held an M1 carbine rifle, and the other had a clear plastic bottle with some sort of liquid inside. This looked to be another robbery, except this time, no words were exchanged. The man with the bottle would pour the liquid into Harry's booth via the small open space, normally used to exchange cash and tokens. He then struck a match and threw it into the booth. It would be mere seconds before the inside of Harry's booth was up in flames, with him having no time to escape. The intense flames would cause an explosion, demolishing the entire booth with Harry inside. He was thrown from the booth from how intense the explosion was and his entire body was up in flames as he lay unconscious. A few moments after, he would wake up feet away from where he last was. Horrified onlookers watched from the platforms and they couldn't believe what they were seeing. Some of these people who watched Harry as he was on fire, running and screaming, knew Harry from their daily commutes. They heard the explosion and watched as the entire booth fell apart. And they watched as Harry did his best to stop himself from burning. Someone would make a call to 911 from a payphone, and a radio call was sent out as quickly as possible. The call stated that there was a man on fire near the token booth. Two officers in a squad car not too far from the scene were the first to respond to the call. They drove as fast as they could, speeding down Utica Ave, quickly coming upon the Kingston Throop Station. They exited their car and approached the stairs to make their way down and they could already see and smell the smoke. Out of the smoky staircase emerged Harry, who managed to somehow make his way up to the street level. He landed right in one of the officer's arms, and his entire body was charred and still smoldering. All of his clothing had been burned off except for his underwear, and part of his shirt was burned to his back. Harry was able to speak and tried telling the officers what had taken place. He would say, Help me. They blew up my booth. I want my family. He wasn't in good shape, and they knew that if they waited for EMS, Harry may not make it. They had to get him to a hospital as soon as possible. They made a fast decision and lifted Harry, and as they did, any time they touched him, skin came off. The back of their squad car had skin and blood on it from them trying to get Harry into the car. Once he was inside, they drove as fast as they could. As they sped toward the hospital, Harry would say, I'm hurting. Please hurry. Don't let me hurt. He was rushed to Cornell Medical Center to be treated right away.
Harry's wife and others arrived shortly after hearing, in shock at the news. When Harry's wife arrived, she was greeted by Mayor Giuliani, who would try to warn her about Harry's condition. He was letting her know that it was bad and wanted her to be prepared for what she would be seeing. According to reports, when she entered the room, she saw Harry lying there, and he was three times his regular size, his body swollen from the severe burns. Burns covered every part of him. One doctor said he had burns to 60% of his body, while another would say it was more than 90%. Harry also suffered severe damage to his lungs from breathing in fire and smoke. He had to be put under some very, very powerful sedatives for his pain, and in order to breathe, he needed to be hooked up to a respirator. His family was at his bedside every day. Many others visited, from co-workers to old friends to union reps from the Transit Authority. Harry's wife was interviewed shortly after the incident and shared her feelings about what took place. She had this to say, I am going to see my husband at the hospital today, and I'm going to pray for him. I was raised a Southern Baptist, and I have a deep faith in God, and whatever God wills is what I will accept. They spoke to Harry every night they spent at the hospital with him, unsure if he could hear their words. He fought for his life for 14 days and succumbed to his injuries at 9.05 a.m. on December 10th of 1995. Family members would gather at the Kaufman household to pay their respects. The feeling of loss swept over the city, especially among the many still working the same job as Harry. Workers who didn't know if or when they'd find themselves in an awful situation like this. As soon as this took place, the investigation into the crime unfolded. When authorities checked the scene, they'd find a burned glove that had been charred black, a burned match booklet, and the M1 rifle mentioned earlier. All three items believed to belong to the people who did this to Harry. Many travelers who were around or near were asked if they knew or saw anything. Different descriptions of the men were given, but they were still on the loose. As they continued to investigate, they'd find other issues. The token booths back then were all equipped with fire containment systems. There were these sensors in the corners of the booth that would detect smoke. They could also detect the flicker of fire and any sudden temperature changes inside the booth. The second something like that takes place, the system would quickly extinguish the fire inside. The system was so sensitive that there were known to be instances where kids would throw matches into the booths just to set the system off as a prank. It was said that the sensors in Harry's booth were either disabled or covered. The reason for this being that many clerks back then were smokers. If they wanted to smoke inside of the booth, it would trip the system. So sometimes the sensors were either covered with clothing or something else to prevent that. It was seen from the start that fingers were being pointed at the victim and not the people who did this to him. The blame didn't go unrecognized by Harry's family. His wife was quoted as saying, I don't understand why this rush to judgment. Let them prove these allegations. Major blame was also directed at the release of the Hollywood motion picture, Money Train, featuring Wesley Snipes, Woody Harrelson, and Jennifer Lopez. The movie's plot takes place in New York subway system, even partially filmed in it. There's a scene in the movie where the villain of the story walks up to a token booth clerk and asks her if she knows what it's like to smell her own flesh burning. He then squirts a flammable liquid into the booth, forcing her to open up the door to be robbed. He takes the money, but lights the match anyway, setting the booth on fire. The movie was released on November 22nd of 1995, just a few days prior to the attack on Harry. Immediately, reports would start talking about the movie's release and how the story inspired this attack. The Transit Authority president at the time had the following to say, We objected to these scenes. We didn't like the concept of the movie. It was said that there were real fears of this movie inspiring a real robbery of the armed money train that was known to travel through the underground tunnels, mostly at night. The train that would pick up money from each station. In newspapers and in broadcasts, the city looked at money train as a reason. But the movie was allowed to film in our subway system for part of the film's production. There was so much negative press that it would quickly get the attention of the filmmakers and the actors. Wesley Snipes was quoted as saying, 
My prayers are with Harry Kaufman and his family. And Woody Harrelson was quoted as saying, I feel terrible for Mr. Kaufman and his family. I'm sure the movie did not create the mentality of the men who perpetrated this crime, but still, I feel remorseful and I am deeply saddened by what happened. Harrelson had dealt with this type of situation before. He was also in the movie Natural Born Killers, a movie that was also in headlines for similar reasons, with many blaming the movie for the slayings of a mother and a sister carried out by a teenager in 1994. There were even reports that quoted Harry's wife as saying that she wanted to speak to Wesley Snipes about what happened, saying that she wanted him to call her, but she denied that in a future report, clarifying that she hadn't even seen the movie and flat out denied ever asking to speak to Wesley, despite how some reports made it seem. It just wasn't true. There were talks of even pulling the movie, but that never happened. There's no real way to tell if a movie that dropped only five days before this tragedy really inspired anything. But what is known is that when the movie Money Train was being written, they were getting their inspiration from real life events, events that already took place in this city seven years before this movie's release. The incident I'm speaking of took place in June of 1988. There were a bunch of incidents in the 80s that involved token booths being set on fire. The victim in the particular case in question was 39-year-old Mona Pierre. She was working at Brooklyn's Halsey Street Station when she too was approached by someone looking to commit a robbery. Then the person poured liquid into her booth and set it on fire with her inside. She too died of her severe injuries. She had her job as a token booth clerk for less than a year before her life was taken. When Mona passed away, the automatic fire extinguishing systems were installed into all token booths. Before this, if a situation like this occurred, the clerks inside of the booth would have to pull a pin and that would then trigger the system. Those systems were installed sometime in 1981 and a great deal of them didn't work properly. So it wasn't as if there was this solid system in place at that point. In 1989, the year after these automatic systems were installed, they were accidentally tripped over 900 times, costing more than a quarter of a million dollars. Other than this, a lot of the booths and train stations were riddled with bullets from attempted robberies. This was happening in the subway system long before Money Train was even thought of. They didn't really need a film to inspire such a savage crime when all they had to do is turn on the evening news or open a paper and find the real thing. For a while, many lost focus of what really mattered. No matter what inspired who, the end result was an innocent life lost. Many people in Harry's position had spent years speaking of the lack of protection when it came to working underground. Fires, shootings, robberies, workers were victims to all of the above, and not much had changed. Something needed to be done, and fast. A funeral was held for Harry Kaufman on December 13th of 1995 at the First Calvary Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York. More than 700 people would show up to pay their respects. Those in attendance included workers from all over the city, family, friends, and Mayor Giuliani, among many others. Harry's casket was brought into the main room for the service, a beautiful white casket covered in flowers and was surrounded by numerous flower arrangements and wreaths. One of the arrangements was in the shape of a transit authority badge, complete with Harry's badge number, 94741. Many stood at the podium sharing kind words about Harry, and expressing their heartfelt condolences to the family. Tears flowed as many still struggled to deal with what happened to Harry. The cowardly attack from that day resulted in this, his life being taken, a family torn at the loss, and hundreds of workers asking themselves if one day this will be how it ends for them. A moment that truly stood out for everyone in attendance was when Harry's son would stand at the front of the room during the service with his saxophone in hand, he held the instrument loved by him and his father and would begin playing his rendition of Amazing Grace. The crowd stood quietly and watched him play the song in memory of Harry, not using many words to express his pain, 
but letting the music speak for him. His family tried their best to stay strong as they laid Harry to rest, when normally, around this time of year, they would be preparing for Harry's birthday, which would have been just two weeks after his funeral on Christmas Eve. He would have turned 51 years old. While Harry's family was making arrangements for his wake, police were still trying to find who did this to him. In many of the cases of torchings and muggings in the subway system, the people responsible were never caught. Authorities were determined to find who was responsible. A $21,000 reward was put out for any information regarding Harry's slaying. Tips came in, and through their investigation, authorities claimed it led them to their first suspect, 18-year-old James Irons. According to his family, James was a regular kid, someone who had a hard time in school and worked odd jobs in his Brooklyn neighborhood. He was from the area. In fact, his apartment wasn't far from the station that all this took place. The night Harry was attacked, James had just come home from a party and was in the kitchen making something to eat. An explosion could be heard, and when James' mother ran to the window, she saw a man in the street, and he was on fire. She then told her son James to call 911, and he did. Authorities stated that a tip they'd received came from someone local, and it led them to James, arresting him on December 14th of 1995. A short time after his arrest, authorities were saying they had a videotaped confession from him, saying he was a lookout in the incident. But to his family, who knew this couldn't be true, it was clear that something was very wrong. From the start, James' parents, who had rushed to his aid the second he was arrested, knew he was home when the explosion happened. James' mother had the following to say. He must have been awful fast, running up four flights of stairs. In other words, saying he couldn't be in two places at once. James' stepfather would also say that his lack of book smarts could have easily left them open to being tricked during questioning, something we've seen before, when certain methods are used to get the answers that authorities want. Police would also arrest 18-year-old Thomas Malik and a 17-year-old by the name of Vincent Ellerby. Police managed to get confessions from them too, but from the start of all of this, things fell into place strangely, and it was very reminiscent of past events that garnered the same level of attention. In this case, witness accounts of who they saw do this didn't match that of the people in custody. The confessions of the teens didn't add up with one another, and their confessions didn't add up with the evidence that was found at the scene. In many situations where coercion is involved, it's common for this to happen, for the stories that the so-called suspects are telling to not add up, because they're being fed the information in different ways. Sometimes, during questioning, people are promised that they can just go home after telling authorities what they want to hear. Things just did not add up, and despite confessing to the crime, all three of them kept saying that they were innocent and that certain things were either taken out of context or flat out lies. When all was said and done, the picture that was painted was that each of these men played a role in Harry Kaufman's slaying. They said that Irons and Malik were the lookouts and Ellerby sprayed a flammable liquid into the booth, but they were unsure if he struck the match. One big inconsistency with Irons' confession was when he described the getaway car that the others got into. He described it much different from other witnesses, and the getaway car was said to be a block away and around the corner, impossible for him to even see. This was ignored. Ellerby stated he poured gasoline outside of the booth even though it was known that it was poured in through the token slot. This didn't add up. He also described four others, while witnesses said it was two men, maybe three. These obvious discrepancies were ignored by the detectives who were interviewing them. There were many theories about who played what role in the crime, a crime that they kept saying they weren't there for. While they continued to say they were innocent, they would all be charged with second-degree murder and sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. In Iron's case, the call he made to 911 that would prove he wasn't there was never played for the jury. The three men would spend more than 25 years behind bars Life behind bars was a nightmare in ways that most of us will never understand. Prison can take someone who never had a bad bone in their body and turn them into someone entirely different, something unrecognizable. A lot of us have family who's been in the system before. You hear the stories of those who were wrongfully accused, 
an image painted of them that couldn't be further from the truth. And it would be a very long time before the real truth surfaced. Harry's life had come to a tragic end. And now, three more lives and that of their families would be forever altered. But in 2013, a different type of investigation involving these three men was underway. It turns out that one of the detectives who interviewed the then teens was using dirty methods to get the answers he wanted. He screamed at the teens, angrily banged on the table, struck, and slammed one of the teens' heads into a locker. He was also said to be feeding classified details of the crime to Malik and Irons. When they confessed to something and it didn't make sense with the story he was trying to fake, he would brush it off like it didn't matter, and again, would feed info and carefully guide them so they were saying what he wanted them to. That same detective would later admit to pounding the table and screaming at the teenagers, but he denied hitting them. What was always suspected by friends, family, and others for almost three decades was confirmed. The courts concluded that these confessions were coerced. The assistant DA would tell the court that after nearly three decades, they, quote, had no confidence in the integrity of those convictions. Finally, officially determining that the confessions were false. When they investigated, they'd see that this detective was already under fire and had faced major scrutiny for a lot of the cases that he and other detectives worked on. Cases where it was stated that they were repeatedly accused of forcing confessions and framing suspects to have them take the fall for things they didn't do. Case after case, the same dirty tactics were used on other people who didn't do anything. I know some people are asking themselves, why would anyone confess to something they didn't do? It's a fair question. It's just very important to remember the psychological mind games that are often played. For some, before they know it, they're telling a story they had no part of. Due to this huge piece of information being confirmed, the three men who were accused of doing this to Harry were exonerated, a crime they had no part in. The three of them stood strong during their sentences, never fully giving up hope that the truth would someday be revealed, always maintaining that they were innocent. They said they were victims of coercion from the very start, and nobody would listen. But their day to be heard finally came. They were finally free. After nearly 30 years in prison, three men were cleared of killing a clerk who was set on fire in a subway toll booth. The three confessed to and were convicted of murdering token seller Harry Kaufman in 1995. The attack bore some resemblance to a scene in the film Money Train, which had been released days earlier. A judge dismissed the murder convictions after Brooklyn District Attorney Eric Gonzalez cited serious problems with the evidence. Prosecutors say the confessions conflicted with evidence at the scene and with each other. The DA says witness identifications were also problematic. Still shocked because this is supposed to have happened a long time ago. They knew the truth all along, but, you know, they withheld it, you know, um, deliberately. They was just looking for a conviction. They didn't care who it was. They knew the truth. The person that did it told me did it. They kept it away. So we had to go to the penitentiary. And it's a nightmare. Definitely a nightmare. It's a nightmare. You don't know what it's like to really be inside that cell. James Iron, Thomas Malik, and Vincent Ellerby were each sentenced to 25 years to life in prison when they were teens for a murder of a Brooklyn token seller, Harry Kaufman, back in 1995. Prosecutors today saying this case was, quote, riddled with factual errors, coerced confessions, and manufactured evidence, and that the conviction no longer stands. And they faced a reality in prison that was so vicious and so brutal that, that it is truly incomprehensible to any of us. Defense lawyers say police on the original case had a long track record of unethical practices, including lying. The courtroom was packed with family members, emotion overtaking at times. What happened to us can never be fixed. It ain't enough money in the world that can fix it. Powerful testimony from Ellerby, who was released on parole two years ago. Pay attention to one or two things, you know. They break you, they turn you into a monster just to survive. What happened to Harry in November of 1995 and others before and after him 
speaks volumes of not only the state of the New York subway system decades ago, but the state of how cases were often handled in the city. What happened to these teens and others like the exonerated five tell an entirely different story. What type of justice are families receiving if the people who really committed these crimes were never actually captured? What type of closure is there when a story is fabricated and multiple lives are destroyed? The most important question, however, is what would possess someone to do something so cruel to another human being while they're just trying to earn a living? Was it really for money? Or was it just a cruel act where they wanted to see someone suffer? We may never know. Harry's life was taken in a cruel fashion, and his family was left having to bear the weight of this huge loss. Nothing could ever change what happened that day. Nothing could take away the pain his loved ones still feel to this day. And for the three men who had an entire city against them, in a sense, their lives were taken too, stripped away from them for something they played no role in, despite constantly professing their innocence, valuable years that they can't ever get back. A poem dedicated to Harry's life was on the back of his funeral program, and it said the following, God saw you were getting tired, and a cure was not to be. So he put his arms around you and whispered, Come to me. With tearful eyes, we watched you and saw you pass away. Although we loved you dearly, we could not make you stay. A golden heart stopped beating, hard-working hands at rest. God broke our hearts to prove he only takes the best. My deepest condolences go out to all of his family and his loved ones, and rest in peace to Harry Kaufman, who lost his life underground. He won't be forgotten.